Welcome back, everyone. We are very excited to have you for our second presentation this morning. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, the team from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Our second presentation is on enhancing ABA assessment and treatment using basic and advanced computer assisted technology. It will be presented by Dr. Mark Dixon and his team from the Cognition, Behavior and Mindfulness Clinic at UIC. In this presentation, they will cover multiple innovative areas in the delivery of behavior analytic intervention and research for autism using computer-assisted technologies. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A, and we will take questions when the presentation is finished. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Dixon and colleagues. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate everybody uh, coming to our presentation today. It's going to be a showcase of four of us presenting a variety of explorations into the utilization of technology for both the data capturing that is involved in ABA services, as well as the, the use of technology to greater enhance the learning experience of the individuals that we serve. So, you know, as we all have been experiencing in the last decade or two, we've seen a a radical um, increase in the ways in which technology are starting to infiltrate our world of work. Um, we have, uh, you know, an industry that has gone almost exclusively paperless. And as a result, for better or worse, we've had to learn these systems. And, you know, once we get over that learning curve, there does seem to be some benefit to going digital in terms of the types of uh, information that can be shared easily, the uh, decisions that can be made with respect to uh, a, a more comprehensive package of data and uh, the sharing of, of content um, from home to, to the provider as well. What we know in, in the fields that surround us or what, what these other guys are, are, are discovering that um, I think it's time that we start getting in the, uh, in the game with is that we actually can improve uh, the type of care that's delivered when we move to automated systems uh, because we uh, have shown in the literature over and over again that they reduce errors and in input um, and uh, there, there's more of a a streamlined system for operational uh, uh, conversations across across the team, and uh, there is a a level of reduced uh, cost and uh, and ease of of use of these systems once that learning curve has occurred. Um, so you know what we'll show today are you know a snapshot of three different domains of where these systems have been put in place um, by our group. And I, I'm not sure that you can go from zero to 100% of, of skill mastery within this next hour, but I want you to hopefully maybe see this as somewhat of a, of a uh, preview of what can happen. And also how, you know, if, if any of these areas are of interest to certain subgroups here today, that we'd be more than happy to, to dive deeper and, and do a more expanded version of, of any of the content that we're gonna kind of quickly show um, during our time together. Um, by doing this, we, you know, there is some, you know, cost of, of putting things together. We're going to show uh, some content that's, that's pretty inexpensive, it's, it's things even using PowerPoint and some online survey tools that um, are, are relatively inexpensive. So it's not as if, you know, an entity needs to invest, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in order to get uh, moving from a, a paper and non-tech world to, to some of the things that we're talking about. Today and you know the transitions, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, you wouldn't believe how old I am. You know, I have a good plastic surgeon, but um, you know, you know, transitioning to something new is is oftentimes difficult. Um, but you know, once you get past that, I mean, you know, it, it's worth it in terms of the the possible uh, benefits that can come to the clients that we serve. So, what have we done in ABA? 
I mean, this is one of the uh, areas that I've had interest in for the last, you know, two decades or so. Um, I, I published articles back as early as like 2003 on and using computerized data collection uh, systems to, um, you know, track performance of, of clients, whether it be challenging behaviors or or skill acquisition. And wrote books on computer software. I, I I don't know if it's a product of having to take computer classes in high school or or what, but um, you know this has been an area that I I'm really excited to have been part of from really the beginning in the field, as well as to to help um, share some of that information uh, with you guys in in how it's evolved over those past two decades. Um, you know, we we in this thing called ABA tend to believe that you know data matter and and the integrity of those data should be at the forefront of the decisions that we make. And as a result, you know, the the cleaner we can get those data, the less um, biased, the, the the more um, on time those data are arriving, and the ease of which they can be analyzed are are really important for us to make decisions. And you know, we've been able to do things and there's been articles that have come out, you know, in the last 10 years or so on, on using Excel to make graphs and um, various types of, you know, apps that you can use to to capture um, data at, so, at some level of integrity. And that, you know, while the um, the, the electronic systems might be uh, more uh, technologically you know, advance and, and uh, ease of use, they don't necessarily um, come at, uh, you know, any type of uh, extended uh, burden to, uh, to, to staff that are used to pencil and paper. Now, you know, with the advent of, of um, you know, this, this chat GPT and some of these learning systems, you know, we've been playing with it a little bit in, in, our, in our lab. And I mean, it can write behavior plans better than a lot of behavior analysts can um, with with very basic information. I'm not saying that's a good thing, um, but you know, technology is here and, and I'd rather that we get ahead of it or at least get in with it rather than um, let it pass us by. Next. So, you know, what, what we've seen, um, you know, in, in the field, I think, is a focus primarily on, on collection and analysis of data but I want to I'm going to move us a little farther um, today with uh, kind of examples of how we can take technology and and infuse it into the actual care that we deliver. Um, the gamification of of therapy, um, computer based training that gets the kids excited and engaged in ways that they may not with paper and pencil or flashcards or some of the kind of the old school materials that we've all used to try to, to um, initiate engagement. Um, also going to talk a little bit about um, how to scale up some of our demonstrations here in, in our field of, of behavioral psychology or behavior analysis. Um, we often rely on single case um, studies or um, small numbers of subjects in which we tell more stories about that person rather than a, a large scale implementation that has a greater potential for external validity and adoption by the larger community. And so we're going to um, showcase some of that as well in, in, in a public school here in, in Illinois. Um, so in the remaining of our time together, we're going to talk a little bit about proof of concept in terms of how do we automate some of the basic procedures that we use on a daily basis when delivering ABA care. Uh, we're, I'll, I'll talk again about the uh, the rollout of something like this in a in a public school system um, in Southern Illinois area. And then Amanda will wrap things up with kind of some how to's on putting this together from not only, um, you know, data capturing, but also uh, the entire intake and assessment process and how we can we can do this digitally pretty quickly and how, and um, show some examples of the technology that we use at UIC to uh, completely automate our intake um, package in which we can actually send to a family uh, before they show up for that first, first meeting, uh, thus providing us with a variety of uh, pieces of information about their child before we see them for the first time. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to John. 
plot twist. He's actually going to turn it over to me. Okay. It's a hot potato this morning. All right. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about evaluating the effectiveness of automated match to sample procedures among autistic learners. Um, so the remote delivery of discrete trial training or DTT is becoming more prevalent throughout research, right? So the computerized programming is also becoming more prevalent as this field of ABA continues to progress. And this is kind of due to this adaptability and efficiency that we're finding throughout this programming. Um, so computerized programs and this idea of delivering content through a telehealth mode became super imperative um, to continuing services for um, in certain cases during like that COVID-19 pandemic that we're still going through, right? Um, and in this present study, we are going to utilize this technology and embed the peak curriculum within this. And it can be adapted and utilized for a variety of evidence-based interventions. And this method can be very efficient and cost-effective um, and shared, you, shared libraries can be utilized amongst technicians for varieties of different clients simultaneously. Um, and the use of this technology could even promote support by other providers who might also need to work remotely and um, even be used for parent training. Next slide. Um, so why would we even explore the use of technology in therapy? Um, you know, why would we take this time to explore and evaluate this, this use, right? So as clinicians, I feel we should be striving to grow as individuals, you know, with our fellow staff um, to promote better protocols for our clients and kind of push our field towards that innovation, right? And technology can be more efficient at, at, in certain times, in certain cases. It can promote faster presentation. It's portable, it's compact, right? There can be less technician errors. Um, and it's somewhat a training package in itself, in and of itself, right? So I can automate this complex decision-making. So I can automate selecting the stimuli and randomizing the array that can free the therapist up to really focus on how to keep the client engaged instead of fumbling around with those picture cards. I know that's something that I'm very familiar with. You get this, you know, perfect array. It's all, it's all randomized. And then you have a learner that swipes them to the floor, right? So this is kind of removing that, that problem in a, in a little bit. We'll kind of talk about that. And then tabletop cards can also provide more challenging challenges for staff. Um, so technology that it's automating this process. It can be more difficult for tech savvy individuals in that same right. Um, and so a con of those tabletop cards could be that clients with those challenging behaviors could delay that work by disrupting um, the array, right? So that's swiping to the ground or um, having to pull it back and then represent it for presentation. Um, and then COVID, I, I, we kind of already touched on this, but this came along and, and changed the game for how clinicians are able to deliver these services while stuck at home um, and not able to deliver that one-on-one -on -one in-person therapy. And so we couldn't really focus and, and rely heavily on blocking or restricting access to those, those powerful reinforcers. We instead had to make the task reinforcing within itself. Um, and this can be thought of kind of as an antecedent strategy, but why stop when COVID starts to kind of slow down? I hate to say stop, so we're going to say slow. Um, but couldn't we have been doing this the entire time, right? Shouldn't we continue to explore this use of technology in the future? And that's kind of what we're doing a little bit with this, with this first study here. Um, so jumping into the materials, um, all of the trials included an arbitrary symbol, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but then it also included in images of familiar items. And then we created four sets of 
five stimuli each, so 20 total. Um, and this was done to stimulate running four different DTT programs simultaneously that were identical in difficulty. Um, and we used those random arbitrary symbols just to ensure that the participants didn't have any prior history or learning to those symbols. Um, and consider that we're using this as like a tool to quickly compare a new training method at the level of, of that single subject. Next slide. Okay. Um, and there for, for the present study, there were three participants, which we do recognize as a small sample size, um, but there were two male clients with ASD and one female client with ASD and ADD. Um, and their ages ranged from eight to 13. Um, and so unlike most studies where you're looking for that deviation from the baseline, we're actually going to assume that baseline is going to show those higher rates based on that previous research in DTT. Um, but what we want to see is this high rate of mastery not being disrupted when we are introducing this automation or this computerized um, presentation. Um, and so when we introduce this, this new technology that's supposedly more efficient, right, we want to make sure that we're not throwing something out that we already know is efficient and works great. Um, so we already know, right, that DTT is effective, but how can it compare to a computerized presentation? So as we, as we mentioned, those two sets of stimuli are going to be created for, for tabletop, along with two separate sets for PowerPeak on the Surface Pros. Um, and then each trial were run in um, five trial blocks. And then they included that arbitrary symbol with um, the images of those familiar items, which I already mentioned those symbols were just um, to ensure they didn't have any previous history with those stimuli. And then to, uh, to compare the two training modalities, we evaluated this using kind of an alternating treatment design and this design really involves um, alternating that intervention quickly and rapidly to see if there's any difference. Um, and it's used a lot in experimental FAs, but you can also sort of use it and adjust it for instructional methods. So that's what we did here. So uh, we created those four sets of five stimuli, and that was just done, again, to stimulate that four DTT programs simultaneously. Um, and I'm going to play a video here in just a second. but um, we're, it's just going to outline that instructions of the program and kind of how, how it's functioning. If you want to go ahead and play that. Okay. So here is the instructions page. So the following is designed to allow for five congruent targets. To begin on the selection stream, the instructor records their selection as the stimulus number on the peak data sheet. Once the correct stimulus is selected, the program will lead to a screen indicating the correct response. Instructors should continue to prompt to the correct response as in any other program. When replacing stimuli, be sure to upload image in the existing button to retain program functionality. So let me walk you through this. So for this, each color will represent one congruent target. So selection one, with this symbol, you'll select one image that you think corresponds with the symbol. So let me say, I think it's the shoe. I did not get any feedback. So let me try the pillow. Again, no feedback. Let's try the cereal. Okay, so that's when you get that correct screen. And if you click this button, it's going to give you, it's going to prompt you back to that selection screen. Here you can pick another selection target. Let's click 17 this symbol, that's where you get that correct screen where it'll take you back to the, the selection panel again. Oh, it just never gets easier listening to yourself um, online. Go ahead and skip to the next page. Okay, so moving to the results. Um, on this x-axis, we are going to have this number of trial block, and on that y-axis, we're going to have that percent independent correct. Um, and as you can see here, if you click one more, awesome, if you uh, participant one and participant two kind of learned at that same rate when comparing that table 
top to power peak stimuli. And then at that top right component, you'll see that key. It's a little hard to see. So if anybody needs me to send um, another file of the graph, please let me know. I'll drop my email in the chat. But again, um, as you can see, participant one and two learned roughly at the same rate. Um, and so again, just to remind you, what we're looking for in this graph is that the automation or that computerized technology, when that's introduced, that it's not disrupting that pre-existing level of mastery. Um, and then if you click one more, Perfect. Um, and then we can see the participant number three was not successful, um, regardless of power peak or tabletop. And I included this participant just uh, because this is reminding us that these modalities of displaying stimuli, they're not really replacing our behavior analytics strategies in any capacity, right? Um, in general, Participant three it was a client that often required adaptations regardless of how that stimuli was often presented and frequent adaptations for this participant um, has been needed and might be needed uh, in the future, like such as like more reinforcement, you know, more pre-teaching, uh, potentially a smaller field array, um, et cetera. And we can adjust those things um, throughout our behavior analytics strategies, obviously. Next slide. And then jumping to the social validity component, um, all of the staff who ran the study on these clients were asked if which they preferred more, the Power Peak presentation or that tabletop card presentation. Um, and so four out of the five or 80% preferred that Power Peak component over the tabletop stimuli. Um, but the one staff that did select the tabletop cards, that is a senior staff with years of experience using DTT cards, um, whereas the other staff running the study had under a year of experience within the field. Um, these kind of can easily contribute to, to their preferences, um, which, which, which makes sense. And then uh, with the clients, when they were asked what their, their preferences were, two out of the three or 67% reported preferring Power Peak over that tabletop component. And so many of their um, reinforcers, when you think about it, can be found on tablets. And so we kind of tried to control for, for that original component by not using the Power Peak devices for reinforcement. However, they still kind of use tablet time as their preferred reinforcer using, you know, um, an iPad or, or a different tablet that they might have brought from home. Um, and so what if we had exposed a particular client or staff to kind of both modalities and allowed them to kind of choose and allow them, allow the clients to have that that programming choice, right? And having staff have that, that programming decision regardless, they're, they're, they're running those. And so have, having that, that decision way and um, on what presentation they're more confident with as, as well as what the client would be more successful in using. And so now what? Um, the study kind of began to focus the automation of programming for individuals that we work with and how to best choose that modality that's fitting their learning. So how could we allow staff to kind of choose the modality that works um, that uh, for the stimuli and, and create that overall, you know, satisfaction and, and work performance and then, you know, could, you know, increasing that client preference, decrease challenging behavior, as well as like, how can we adapt these methods to track learner response time and, and frequency and error and um, things such as that. But if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm gonna hand it over to John. All right, thank you, Meredith. Hello everyone, my name is Zhi uh, Hui Zhang Yi, and uh, I'll be presenting the second portion of our study, which is a exploratory randomized trial to evaluate the clinical outcome of a computer-assisted revisional training platform. So picking back to what Meredith said, uh, what this power peak, this computerized presentation of stimuli used in natural sample procedures uh, is slightly different from what the field has been sort of seeing in this line of research using informational technology within ABA in the sense that it doesn't really focus on the collection of the data per se. Uh, when using what Meredith showed, the data are still being tracked manually by the clinician. 
However, it sort of changed the way of how instruction actually happens. Uh, again, clearly there are benefits, uh, at least uh, what Meredith's proof of concept data shows, is that a computer-based presentation of stimuli does not adversely impact uh, the speed of skill acquisition and also potentially a yielded higher social validity indicated by more preferred uh, option by clients and also staff. Um, but the second sort of question to follow up is that, okay, what will be the next step? Uh, because again, all the data are still being tracked manually by pen and paper. There are very limited clinical decision support. It is still sort of uh, kind of a bare bone system compared with what other allied health professionals has been used as electronic health record or information systems in health record. So this is what we are trying to do here. So in terms of participants that we're using, uh, there are eight students, always IEP qualifying conditions in a public elementary schools. And the table here shows their demographic information. Um, so all of these participants already have ongoing ABA instructions embedded within their uh, IEP or as part of the Spider services. And they use a particular curriculum called the Peak Relational Training System. And uh, all the instructions occur daily during their regular school hours uh, by qualifying staffs who've been received training ABA and how to implement this particular relational training protocol. So this particular study is a single center, uh, single blinded randomized trial, and eight participants are randomly assigned into two groups, the experimental group versus the treatment as usual group. And uh, at any point during their trial, before and after the study, uh, there were no change to their existing ABA targets or instructional methods. So once participants are divided into two groups, we track their performance for three weeks. In week one, everyone is using the traditional pen and paper method for their sort of like existing ABA curriculum. In week two, though, participants in the TAU group sustain no change. They continue doing whatever they were doing prior. However, participants in the experimental group, all their instructions were moved using this computer-assisted relational training platform, which I will go through its sort of uh, major comparison against pen and paper in the next slide. And then in week three, participants in TAU remained on pen and paper and participants on experimental group remained on this computer assisted version of relational training. And the dependent measure that we are targeting or we are tracking is the time spent daily for a school staff to complete this instruction and also staff satisfaction data. So essentially we're trying to compare in week one, are there differences between the group? And in week two, after we move half of the participant to this computer assisted relational training, are there any differences between the experimental group and the TAU? While in week three, we're trying to see does this effect, are, is it able to be maintained? So this particular relational training platform, again, is a custom built platform, which is sort of one step kind of above what Meredith data has been showing. And it is cloud hosted custom built relational training platform. Uh, this particular platform is sort of built in mind uh, in sort of coordination with the peak relational training system. And uh, what the peak relational training system does is that it sort of splits teaching into a few different modalities. So within the field of ABA, we constantly utilize operant conditioning uh, as conceptualized by Skinner as our main sort of a weapon to produce behavior change, which is if you systematically present a reinforcer after the presentation of the behavior, then over time, this particular behavior will be more likely to occur in the future. Well, this particular dimension model clearly makes sense. One potential drawback is that had one behavior not been reinforced previously, then the chance for the behavior to occur in the future might not be there. AKA, whenever we teach a particular skill, that skill was able to be introduced within the learner's repertoire. However, without explicit targeting or explicit programmed consequences, that skill might not be there. So a rational sort of uh, remediation for this particular issue is the promoting generalization. For example, once I taught the learner, uh, this is a pen, for example, I would really want the learner to be able to identify all pens as pens. So that sort of makes sense. 
But even that, there are a lot of flexibility in the way human use languages that cannot be explained by generalization. And this is where original frame theory kind of comes in. Uh, originally conceptualized thing based on Sigmund's stimulus equivalence, later expanding to RFT. What relational frame theory sort of conceptualize is that human language are really sort of based on this ability of relational uh, responding, meaning I uh, deriving relations between stimuli and stimuli based on existing learning uh, histories. So what the peak, what this particular curriculum does is that it explicitly targets uh, all these sort of components of learning, and uh, it includes some clinical decision supports uh, that corrects for sequence bias and visual analysis. So to provide a sort of more clean kind of comparison between what the experimental group does and what the TAU does, for example, intervention goals, both groups remain the same. There is no change uh, to their existing goals targeted in IEP. In terms of program organization, participants in the TAU group, their ABA program was sort of organized using printout of program instructions and also stored in a three ring binder. Whereas for the experimental group, their treatment was sort of electronically stored on this racial training platform. In terms of the manipulables or stimuli used, both groups continue to use physical objects, for example, items, toys, shapes, etc., or laminated flashcard. For data collection, TAU continue to use pen and paper data collection, while for the experimental group, these data are automatically captured on the digital platform. In terms of the sequence of goals and the sequence of stimuli, the experimental group, this particular platform that we custom built, has some clinical support uh, functions built in where the system automatically accounts for sequence biases, uh, whereas the TAU group is still continue to rely on traditional clinician choice on how to randomize, how to shuffle or stimuli to prevent sequence bias. And of course, uh, because we are capturing all the data electronically, there are additional metadata being captured on the back end. For example, instructional time, who the implementer is, target behavior, or target challenging behavior occurred during instruction. Whereas for the treatment as usual group, all these data might not be captured or they have to be captured manually. So what does the outcome looks like? Uh, we use a two-way mixed ANOVA with a 0 0.05 conventional alpha level, and we use the turkey method to correct for the post hoc p-value. And what we see here is this graph shown on the screen. So on the x-axis, we have three sort of time point, week one, week two, and week three. And the y-axis is the duration measured in minutes for a school staff to complete these instructions. And again, these instructions are done daily, and then there are four participants in each group. The circled uh, this data point, data path, annotate the duration data for experimental group, and the square data path uh, highlight the data for the control group. So what we see here is that there is a significant interaction between group assignment and time, with the p-value smaller than the conventional alpha level. So what we see here is that for participants in the experimental group, from week one to week two, we see a significant decrease in instructional time, meaning that clinicians are able to complete the same curriculum with around like a 30% reduction of time spent in completing those goals. And such effect was able to be maintained in week three. Whereas for participants in the control group, we don't really see any changes in how long it took the clinician to complete the program. And the whiskers you see on the graph are error bars, meaning that if the error bars overlap between the two uh, measures, that means statistically there's no significant difference between how long it takes for the instruction to finish. So we can see in week one, there are no statistically significant difference between how long it takes the RT group or the TAU group to finish instruction. However, in week two, we see those in the control group use the same amount of time, whereas those in the experimental group are using a significantly lesser time, and this pattern was maintained in week three. We also measure staff satisfaction uh, data, where we surveyed staff how easy it is to use this platform and how well does the platform help you to complete tasks that you are trying to do. Because one of the major criticism from the allied health field, whenever they try to roll out information technology, is that there's always gross pain at the beginning, meaning that technology is complicated, transitioning can be disruptive to existing productivity. Uh, but we are sort of happy to see that this transition seems to be going well in this particular exploratory trial. 
uh, staff indicate uh, that the particular platform is relatively is pretty easy to use, and also they are really helpful in helping them completing their day to day tasks. So what does that data mean? So I think currently the data provides some preliminary support uh, of this sort of relational training platform effectiveness in increasing efficiency. Uh, and then there are also potential broader implication uh, that computer assisted relational training can be rolled out site-wise uh, as they seem to decrease instructional time and also staff are having relatively easier time actually running the intervention protocol. However, the study is, of course, without not without limitation. Uh, we have a still relatively small sample size. There's only eight participants against the trial. The duration of the study is only eight weeks. And also, the inclusion of additional dependent variables would also be helpful um, in, in sort of like further uh, helping this. And uh, also, I mean, like this particular uh, data has also kind of like been published in peer review journals, um, so that we're more than happy to share the outcome with anyone who's interested in taking a look at this further. Now, uh, I'm going to turn over to Amanda, and Amanda will sort of uh, show us a few ways uh, where we can uh, sort of like use some of the readily available tools that uh, are already out there, so sort of like enhance the efficiency for ABA treatment assessment process. Amanda? All right, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, please. All right. So um, like John said, I'm Amanda, and I'm gonna be talking about how you can use computer assisted technology to enhance ABA assessments and intervention. Um, all right, so. Uh, there are a number of ways the technology can be incorporated into clinical practice and research, and my job here today is just to help you get started. Here's a list of some, some ways that we've done it here, um, and the, like Dr. Dickinson said at the beginning, nobody is going to be able to learn uh, how to use computer-assisted technology in so 30 minutes or less, in about 15 minutes or less here. Uh, so what I hope to do today is to give you some tips and tricks and some examples on how to use just a couple of really simple tools um, that really don't cost a lot or even anything in some cases. Um, they're relatively easy to use and that we've used here at the CBM clinic regularly in our clinical practice research and also organizational management. Um, and just to throw out there, I'm probably one of the least, my history is that I'm probably one of the least technologically savvy people out there. Um, I uh, hated <laughs> transitioning to electronic data and having to use technology to, you know, be forced to get really creative with how to implement interventions um, and support, you know, clients and staff when everything went digital for the pandemic. Um, I think these are two tools that made it really easy to do uh, and ended up having more benefits uh, once once you get over that learning curve, like Dr. Dixon said. All right, so the first one I'm going to talk about here is PowerPoint, and I'm going to break this down um, really quickly in terms of program and stimulus setup, programming feedback, um, and then program implementation and data collection. So with PowerPoint, um, I'm going to go over the basics of really how to insert you know, the images, picture shapes, icons, video, audio recording, cameo, which is video and more video, uh, like live video, Word, you can use word art, et cetera. Um, all you need to do is when you select the kind of stimulus you want, which I'll show you how to for some of those specific ones, you just drag it around and you can adjust the size, shape, shadows, color, et cetera. Um, most of you, I don't want to assume most of you, a lot of you probably do know how to do those simple adjusting size, shape, colors, and all of that. So I'm not including that in this presentation, but if you do want resources for support on that, uh, feel free to email one of us and we can get you some resources there. So some of the uh, some of the stimuli that you can use just using PowerPoint, which again is something that most of you have access, probably have access to, um, and so it's likely no extra charge, um, beyond what you already need for your clinical practice, research, all of that. Um, so with pictures, you can insert um, from your photo browser, from your uh, file, there's stock images, there's even online pictures. So you could search the web to find stimuli, to find pictures, 
um, without even having to open a browser. So it even cuts out time for having to do that and then get distracted getting on, you know, TikTok, Facebook, Amazon along the way, if you're anything like me. Um, so you can search for specific things like cats. Um, and then it brings up, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's too simple to even, I'm trying to make it, um, more complicated. You just type in cat, search cats, paste in that picture, adjust the size. Um, it also has options where you can filter. So if you want pictures, you know, and you're um, concerned about uh, rights, there's creative commons only option. And then if you hit that filter button, just to the right of that creative commons only, you can actually search by size, shape, um, you know, transparent or not. Uh, lots of different ways that you can really narrow down and get exactly what you're looking for. Uh, you can also insert shapes. You just click there where it's highlighted red uh, with that red box at the top. If you haven't, if, if you, I probably should orient you to at the very top in that kind of menu bar, um, I have a red rectangle, a red square right around the button you'd push to bring up what I have on the right side there. So just to orient you to that really quickly, you hit shapes, you select your shape from this menu. Um, and then again, you can adjust size, color, all of that really easy. You can also search icons, uh, clicking that icons thing. And this is really great for really simple programs. It's, it's really, really, really fast to do this. You can search just kind of outlined or filled in. And I typed in animals here. So animals, vehicles, whatever you need, categories. Um, you can also get images. Uh, again, from the web, really cute goats and stuff here. And then you can also get, and I actually didn't know this until I was putting this together, you can do cut out people and you can have them, you know, engaging in certain actions, uh, you know, acting out certain emotions, um, which a lot of those are are really helpful for uh, some of those programs with clients on, you know, emotion identification, empathy. I mean, there's endless <laughs> possibilities there. Um, there's also an option for inserting videos. Um, you'll notice we've we've done this in this PowerPoint presentation. I married it to this in the PowerPoint presentation. So you click on that video, you can insert movies from browsers, movies from files. You can, again, there's some stock videos and then online movies as well. Um, audio, this is one I use a lot when I'm automating programs for my clients here, um, whether I'm doing remote learning or in-person learning. And I really like this because you can select from audio files or from your browser. So you can get, you know, files that you've already pre-recorded. Um, you can also record new audio files. So all you have to do here, again, really simple, is select record audio. It brings up this little button here. And this is on uh, Microsoft 365 um, for uh, Mac. Uh, so if you're using Windows, it may not look quite the same, but... Um, these options are are likely still available. So you collect that, you select that little red button there to record, and then you record it and you choose, I either hate this and I'm gonna discard it, or I love it, insert it, and... And it's that easy. I don't know if that came through or not, but the little audio recording saying it's that easy. Um, the other one that I, I liked is this little guy here. So I'm sharing my screen and I have this little shape here that has my live video. So, you know, if I were to act out emotions or do imitation or something for online learning, you can make your video really uh, clear in that screen. All right. So in terms of programming feedback, um, this one can take a little bit of time and, in, in, you know, on the front end. Um, but again, using these automated strategies save a lot of time in program implementation. And I think I'll talk about some of the benefits at the end here, but I think the benefits do outweigh the little bit of time that it does take to put these together. And then they're together and you don't have to create them again, you know, for the next client, you might have to move around, you know, choose new pictures, make the stimuli more client specific, but everything's kind of there and set up. So if you want to program feedback, this is stuff like yes, you got it right, no, you got it wrong, you know, descriptive feedback. Um, you just right-click there on whatever it is. So here I have um, right-clicked on try again, or, uh, try again, and you click on action settings, um, hyperlink, uh, hyperlink two there with a, the none and hyperlink two, um, and then you just select your option. So here I'm setting it to go to a specific slide, but you can see here, you can also link it to URL. So you can take them to like, you know, YouTube videos or whatever. Um, and you can also link it to another PowerPoint presentation if you want them to move from one program to another. Um, so you, I, here I selected the slide that I wanted to appear 
um, next. And this is what it ends up looking like. So this is just a simple example, identical matching the sample with, you know, images. So I have the cat at the top and if they select the incorrect, let's say that, you know, you tell them to match, um, they select Oops, right. that's not the right answer. Select try again to give it another shot. Right, so you have the audio feedback. I tried to make it as elaborate as possible. Hit try again, and that's linked to go back to that original slide with the stimuli presented exactly the way they were. There's no, you know, trying to get your stimuli back in the right spot because the client, you know, swiped them because they were upset that they got it wrong. It's really easy, it goes back to that. You collect. That's right, nice job. Select continue to see the next question. Okay, so it ends up being really smooth, really easy. Here's the, you know, goes to the next trial. Um, and another example here without the, the images is this auditory matching. So where you present two different sounds and then you have them say whether or not those sounds were the same or different, teaching those same different relations could look like this. And it's just clicking a button and it goes through the whole trial for me and it's the same every time, ready? Oops. Are these there you go. Are these the same? Right. And then it pops up with this and you select those were not the same. So that was, but you know, if those were both cows mooing, you select, yes, it's the same. Nice job. There's one of those cool people showing that they're very excited. Select continue. Um, in terms of program implementation and data collection, uh, really you just pull it up into slide mode. You've pre-planned it. You pull it up into slide mode and the participant just, or the client just kind of clicks through things. Um, I've also done this where I leave it in I don't put it in slideshow mode um, and I'll have the screen big. I share my screen. So if I'm doing like sorting tasks, the client can just drag the things around on the screen um, and it's really easy. In terms of data collection, this is still manual data collection. So it's computer assisted. There are programs out there other than PowerPoint that can collect data for you. It just takes a little bit um, knowing programming and, and whatnot. Uh, the next one here is Qualtrics, which we use very frequently as well at our clinic. Um, I'm going to really quickly run through creating a questionnaire using templates. There's also an option to create a new questionnaire. There's some auto features. I'll go over a couple of them. There's not enough time to go over all of them. It has really cool auto features. And then program implementation, data collection, and data analysis. So starting with creating a questionnaire using templates, super, super, super easy. I know I keep saying it's easy. It, it just explaining it, it just... It, it really is as easy as it sounds. Um, so you go to this dashboard, when you go to the Qualtrics website, um, you go to this dashboard and you can see here, it kind of gives me summaries of like new responses that I've gotten for some of the stuff I have active. If you go down to the bottom there, that blue button where the arrow is pointing, selecting create a new project, um, then you end up on this page where you can select a survey type. Uh, you'll see here, there's that project template option. I'm gonna zoom in on that. Um, it has all sorts of options that are already ready for you. And I'm going to show you what this looks like using a preset demographic poll. So you, once you click on this, the template you want, it'll bring up this option and you can push get started. Uh, you can name it, participant demographic information, whatever you want, hit create project. And then you end up with a page that looks like this. Um, and you don't have to take exactly what it has in the template. You can adjust it. You can type in new text. You can, you know, mess with colors and fonts and, you know, insert tables and, and um, lots of stuff. So you can adjust it and kind of make it your own. I'm going to move to the next one here. All right. Um, when you're creating new questionnaires, same start, go to this dashboard, new project, and then uh, select um, from scratch, select that survey. Um, and then you'll select again, get started. So kind of same, similar initial steps and name it. Uh, there's also an option here for how do you want to start the survey? So you can create from scratch, which is what I'm going to show you here. You can also bring in a survey that you already have created, um, from another existing project or in your library. Uh, I'm going to show you with creating the new one because it's the most complicated. The other ones you just select. Um, so if you create the project, you end up with 
your, your questionnaire page, it kind of defaults here to that multiple choice, but you see here, you can change the question type and there's tons of different options, Likert scale, um, you know, uh, insert text, um, lots and lots of different options there. And then all of your settings to adjust to again, make it your own. So here's an example of, I did the slider scale. You can adjust the number of statements here. I have three, um, you can insert tables and instructions and, uh, you know, set it where you want to hear have it set in the middle, um, for, you know, to, to, avoid any biases, um, add new questions. You just do add new when you pick the kind of question you want. And um, there's lots of tutorials on Qualtrics as well. For those of you that want, want a little bit more than what I'm giving here, um, there's tons of resources on there for that text. You can do multiple lines, single. I mean, people can write a whole essay on here if you want. Um, you can also use display logic. It makes it really easy to do that. So for example, if I have this social validity questionnaire and I'm asking, would you recommend this intervention to another person? And if they say no, I want more information on why, then what you would do is go through this display logic. This is how easy this is set up. So if they answer according to this question, you know, would you recommend this or not? They answer no, then I want it to present that text box where they can actually insert why they can describe why they wouldn't recommend it to another person. Um, all right, go to the next one here, settings and auto features. Um, if you navigate, this one can be a little tricky to find. Um, to me, the icons weren't super intuitive, but again, there's a learning curve and once you have that, it's it's really easy. So there's that little button there. I have the arrow pointing. Um, you select that. That's the options icon. Select scoring. So this is specifically auto scoring, which has saved us so much time. We do all of our all of our indirect assessments um, and kind of pre evaluation or evaluation assessments this way, and it scores it for us. So they do it. It's scored. We can see their answers. We can see the score. This is a feature that I really wanted to share with you all because it's it's just. It, makes things so efficient for our um, intake process here at the CBM clinic. So you select scoring options. Um, and uh, this is one, there's, you know, you can do this multiple choice as well, but essentially you just kind of click on. So I cleared the scores there. If you want it to score it again, then you just click on that. It turns green and you can adjust the numbers, the value of it. Um, also for multiple choice and all of that. So you'll see down uh, where that third one that's highlighted, child appears not to notice events in the environment when they are being spoken to. Um, it's reverse scored. And all we did there was go in and enter how many points we wanted each to be. Um, so very, very, very easy here. There's a video of that there. Um, there's also this auto email option which I really like because it gives, you know, responses to parents that are confirming things, giving information about location of their assessment, what to bring with their assessment. You can also set it up to where there's reminder emails that they get. You know, you can check in on social validity, uh, you know, on a, on a regular occurring schedule or have parents, you know, for my act sessions, you can have parents describe anything that came up during the week that we can talk to the kid about. Um, so again, you just navigate to options, post survey, and then here it just, it just has you, um, you can select from a library or you can enter a new message in here, just typing it in the box. And again, you can kind of set it to who gets that email, how often it's sending that email. Um, and there's again, videos on Qualtrics showing you more information on that. For data collection implementation, to get it out there, it's super easy. You just, you can email it. There's QR codes. You can give um, a link that's specific for a certain person. You can also use a reusable link. Parents just click on it, takes them to the survey. They fill it out. Um, super easy for them as well. They return it very, very quickly usually is what we've noticed. Um, and then to see the results, if you click on the results tab at the top of the page, it shows you, you know, different graphs and, um, you know, tables on your data. You can kind of play around with how that's being shown. If you want to do, uh, uh, get your data, uh, see the actual scores, you click on that data analysis tab. Um, you can analyze it. So these are my test ones. You can analyze it per person, viewing the response, exporting to PDF. Um, you can also, if you want to look at all of it, then you would just go to the top and you can export the data into, you know, the file type that you're, that's easiest for you to analyze data. So SPSS, Excel, um, and just from there, it's just the same, same stuff that we've been, we've been doing. 
All right. Um, I want to note there's these, there's more programs that are useful. They do take a little bit of training and learning. Um, I know for things that involve coding, such as some of the, you know, some of those listed in the uh, match and a sample, and then some Visual Studio, E-Prime, um, those ones, they do take some coding, but hey, chat GPT can probably help us out with that now. Might be able to ask it for the code and put it in there, making that even easy. So, um, and then just to wrap things up here with a general discussion of everything you've gotten today. So preliminary data suggests that using electronic teaching methodologies is at least as effective as tabletop programming and has high social validity for clients and staff and reduces challenging behaviors, increases engagement. So just those things alone should be telling us that like, that should be enough for us to try, at least try and incorporate some of this into our programming. In addition to that, we see improved clinical outcomes, um, reduced errors. You know, in particular, if you're using the auto programming and auto data collection, you're essentially eliminating human error in there, uh, making the teaching more consistent. Um, it also is, this is a really big one that we've noticed, increased efficiency. Um, I went from being on the phone all day long trying to get through, you know, referral calls to automating our entire intake process, almost our entire intake process. And now not only are we helping more people, but I also have a caseload that I manage and run um, on top of that. So it is saved so much time. It's super efficient. There's also organize, uh, organizational benefits such as improved workflows, more efficient service delivery, and financial benefits without reducing quality of care for the patient, um, and increased accessibility as well, which would allow for individuals who live in areas where services are maybe not as readily available, um, such as low socioeconomic status areas and uh, rural areas, um, so that they can access effective intervention that is at least as good as what they'd be getting in person. Um, for future directions, clinical directions, um, you know, it'd be, I think we need to be incorporating electronic programming and data collection into clinical practice, get creative, you know, gamification, make apps, you know, get really creative, help the kids and uh, I say kids, help our, the people that we're working with. Um, be able to enjoy and have some fun with what we're doing and to make the learning more efficient. Um, we need to be assessing client preference. Like Meredith said, sometimes there's a preference for one or the other. Um, so assessing that preference for teaching modality, incorporating systems of technology into organizational structure. So for example, making that intake process electronic, right? I mentioned we saved a lot of time that way. Um, and uh, in terms of Research, you know, we, we do need more research, right? Replications across participants and programs, um, larger sample size studies evaluating effectiveness, exploring client preference for tabletop versus remote programs, uh, evaluating client engagement and assent for electronic versus tabletop programs, um, evaluating additional measures of strength of response. You know, Meredith had mentioned response, evaluating response time, number of errors made, et cetera. Um, also looking at differences, potential differences, if there are differences with generalization and maintenance and that longer term outcome. So are individuals improving the same or, you know, is there a difference in improvement on assessments and improved functional ability um, and all of that. So that's what I have for you all today. Thank you. We all have for you today. Thank you all so much for your time. And I think we have time for maybe one or two questions real quick. Yes. There was uh, one that came in in the Q&A that um, Dr. Dixon, you indicated you would like to answer. Sure, I'd be happy to. So the question involved whether or not um, some of those same PowerPoint uh, tricks are available on Google Slides. And some of them are, some of them are not. Um, I, um, I, I think that Google is, is always playing catch up to some of these features that Microsoft has. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not really vetted in any of these these programs, but I think part of the reason why there's more um, uh, ability in PowerPoint is because of the fact that it's like hosted locally on your own computer as opposed to in the cloud where Google Slides is. So there's just some funky um, matters with that. So if you have the choice, I would probably just do PowerPoint. Um, but if if you're studying, you know, you, you're in a world where you have to use Google Slides, some of the work that we talked about can be done there as well. Very good. Good to know. And I also wanted to let everyone know that John has put in the link to the Qualtrics platform in the chat and also the link to the study. 
Um, and we can also send those links um, out to everyone who has attended today after the presentation.